Good day. I was really bummed when I found out that um, Nikki Gumbel was speaking at this conference because I don't have the most beautiful accent on the platform. <laughs> I don't want that happening again, okay? <laughs> hey, listen, I was speaking at a, at a church here in, um, in the United States, and uh, uh, there was a church that has become kind of very much engaged with the whole missional conversation. and. Uh, they're trying to kind of uh, uh, move their, their community into a, a commitment to a deeper missional engagement in their neighborhood and so on and so forth. And I happened to be in their town and they invited me to speak on their Sunday morning service. And after it was over, the first guy to come and talk to me was an older man and he said to me, um, he said, look, I've got some problems about this whole missional kind of gig, quite frankly. It's like I'm a bit, I'm a bit anxious about what's happening. Ever since our church started talking about being missional, uh, we don't do evangelism anymore. And I said, well, then your church hasn't got any clue what it means to be missional. It just seems to me as though there's been come some kind of trend in, in various churches to, to reduce being missional to simply uh, acts of kindness and service and relationship building in their neighborhood. But my friends, if we don't ever get an opportunity to announce the name of Jesus and declare that He is King and rules over all and demands allegiance of every man, woman, and child, then we are not being missional. Have you heard those folks that like to quote St. Francis of Assisi, uh, preach the gospel always and if necessary use words? The only people that ever quote that to me are people who don't ever use any words. It's kind of like this is our, our way out, like my whole life is just preaching the gospel, but I don't actually ever declare anything or say anything. Folks, that's not missional. Are you with me? Uh, in fact, uh, David Bosch, the great um, uh, South African missiologist, in response to that quote from St. Francis, said this, of course words are necessary. Unexplained deeds in themselves do not constitute the mission of God's people. Unexplained deeds in themselves do not constitute the mission of God's people. Now, I think it is magnificent that the church, which was once so removed and detached and so devoted to an attractional model, come to us to get the kind of the religious goods and services, has come to a point where there is a rediscovery of incarnational living, of acts of service and kindness, of a recognition of justice as a demonstration of the reign of God, as a commitment to peacemaking and placemaking and friendship building absolutely delighted by it. In fact, I did my best to try to initiate that conversation in our churches. But if that comes at the expense of us actually articulating or speaking about the Lordship of Jesus, then it does not in itself constitute the mission of God's people. I want you to turn to Colossians chapter 2, because I think Paul here gives us a really nice model of what it means for us to be evangelistic and missional people in the context in which he places us. Uh, Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 to 6, it's quite a charming invocation to the congregation to pray for him, and he says this, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation always be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone." Now, it occurs to me that in this passage explicitly, and then throughout many other sections of Pauline literature implicitly, Paul seems to, when it comes to the evangelistic mission of God's people, seems to believe that, that we should take a, a two-pronged approach. On the one hand, it seems that Paul has a very clear sense that there are certain people within the faith community of Jesus who are gifted as evangelists. And there's no question from the way he speaks about himself that he sees himself in that particular category. There are gifted evangelists, and very, in many cases, such as himself, they have a translocal kind of calling. 
Their job is to travel throughout the regions preaching and proclaiming Christ. I think Paul also sees that in that category, the gifted evangelist, there are local evangelists as well. Do you recall when he speaks to Timothy or writes to Timothy and says, do the work of the evangelist as a local pastor rooted and anchored in a particular church in a particular community, have a local expression as being the gifted evangelist. And clearly in this particular passage, our responsibility uh, in the church for those particular people, the gifted evangelists, is that we are to pray, firstly, that they have opportunities to exercise that gift. Second, we should pray that they are bold in seizing those opportunities. This is what he asks the Colossians to pray for him. Pray that I'll have opportunities to proclaim it. Pray that I will be bold in taking those opportunities. And then the third thing he asks is, pray that I might have clarity in the way I present Christ. Now, if Paul assumed that was the job that every single one of the believers in the church of Colossae should fulfill, why does he not then say, oh, and by the way, I'll be praying the same thing for you. I'll be praying that you have lots of opportunities for the gospel and you will boldly step into them and proclaim the gospel with clarity. But he doesn't. Having just coveted their prayers for the gifted evangelists to boldly proclaim the gospel with clarity, he immediately, rather than suggesting you should do the same thing, he then says, and for you, here's what I want you to do. I want you to be wise in the way you conduct yourselves to outsiders. I want you to make the most of every opportunity to have social relationships with people. I want you to let your conversation be full of grace. I want you to know how to answer everyone. Here's my point. I don't think Paul thinks that we're all evangelists. And I don't think that Paul thinks that we should all be trying to put our foot in the door and prize open opportunities to boldly proclaim the gospel to people. I think Paul thinks that there are peculiar people in our midst who are gifted to do that, either translocally or locally. But for most of us, I think what he sees when it comes to evangelism is that our primary mode of proclaiming the gospel will not be with boldness and clarity in kind of public settings. I think he thinks that the primary way we will speak about Jesus will be in response to people's questions. You find the same thing in 1 Peter chapter 3, don't you, where Peter says, Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in you. You see, if you are an evangelist, whether as a local church leader or a translocal evangelist, I'm going to be praying for you where you have lots and lots of opportunities, whether it's meeting Muslims on aeroplanes or proclaiming in public settings or uh, engaging in the public square in some way. I want you to seize every opportunity. I want you to be bold in your proclamation and you'd better get the gospel clear so that people can understand it. But for most of us, I want you to answer people's questions about Jesus, which implies what? which implies that we in some way are living lives worth questioning. This is your primary evangelistic mission. Live a questionable life. <laughs> Nobody is going to ask you about the hope that is in you. No one is going to respond with questions about who you are or how you live or what you're doing if you live just like all the other suburban middle-class people in this country. If you spend the same amount of money on a house as they spend, if you live in the same neighborhood as they live in, if you take the same vacations that they take, if you renovate your kitchen in the same way that they do, if you have the same views that they have, live the same way that they live, if you spend money the same way that they do, if your life looks exactly the same as theirs, what would they possibly ask you about? My friends, I am not going to force you to be a gifted evangelist if you're not. I'm not asking you to, to find an evangie cube or a 
fake survey or I don't want you to kind of dish up some like drawings on a napkin if that's just not your box and dice. I'm not forcing, neither does Paul, the, if I could put it this way, average evangelistic believer into having to be a bold proclaimer. There are people uniquely gifted and qualified for that. Pray for them. But for the rest of us, here's what I want you to do. Live a life that evokes curiosity. Live a life that arouses questions. Live a life that is so freaking weird, people want, and that's a good use of the term freaking, don't you think? So freaking weird that your tattoo artist wants to know who you are, that your kids, friends, parents want your kids at the party. You can say, well, I'm not gifted like Hugh and I'm not, I'm not that kind of person. What kind of person is that? It's just the kind of person that lives a life so exquisitely differently to the rest of suburban America that people want to know, who the heck are you? And at that point, you need to declare the gospel, no question. But my friends, they aren't asking you, are they? They're not intrigued by you, are they? And they're not intrigued by the members of your congregation either. And yet, my friends, this is how we, the Christian movement, subverted and conquered the Roman Empire, was it not? We did not subvert and conquer the Roman Empire by door knocking and by literature distribution. We conquered and subverted the Roman Empire by living such an extraordinarily exquisitely alternate lifestyle, we literally transformed history. Do you know that in the fourth century, the emperor of Rome, a guy called Julian the Apostate, became so concerned that the Christian movement was subverting and taking over the empire that he sent a directive out to all his officials, Roman governors right throughout the empire, saying, we are in trouble. We are going to lose control of this empire if we do not stop these Christians from what? Preaching in the, in the marketplace? Door knocking? Evangicubing? What was his big concern about them? That these Christians actually feed people who are not part of their assemblies or gatherings. These people tend the, cra the graves of the dead who are not part of their religion. These people practice hospitality and take strangers into their homes. These people treat their, their, their wives as their sisters. These people treat slaves as their brothers. He delineates all the evil things that the Christians are doing. And because they're doing them, Romans are falling into their religion in droves. We transformed the empire by living such a freaky, weird life in such a way that no Roman had ever seen it before. Every man had three women, a wife to bear him sons, a concubine for sex, and a mistress to be seen in public with. Slaves were treated unspeakably terribly. We treated women as chattel. We cared not for the poor. We had no interest in hospitality, in hospices, in hospitals. We didn't heal people. We didn't care for people. It was dog eat dog. It was men on top. It was only the strong survive. And then along comes Christians, followers of Jesus, and we healed the sick, and we fed the hungry, and we treated women as equals. And whether you are pagan or Jewish or otherwise, you are welcome into our table. You ate our food. You drank our wine. We tended you while you were sick. We cared for your grave if you died. And Julian the Apostate writes to all the Roman governors and says, we're going to lose control of the empire if these people keep doing this. And his was his directive. Don't stop them, because if you stop them, there would be outrage, wouldn't there? He says to all the Roman governors, I want you to outlove the Galileans. Build better hospitals. Feed more hungry people. 
take care of the lost and the lonely and the slave. Well, guess what? That didn't work. Why didn't that work? Because you can't make a pagan governor love someone. It's not a Christian strategy, is it, folks? We are filled with the Holy Spirit of love. Now, my friends, in the first century, second, third, fourth centuries, when Christians lived like that, it was so intriguing, so outrageous, so unlikely, so unheard of, so bizarre, so countercultural that of course people availed themselves of that hospitality and of course they then said, why do you do this? And of course they declared the Lordship of Jesus. Are you with me? Yeah. My friends, being a fine, upstanding, middle-class, suburban American is not intriguing. Paying your taxes, putting your kids in private schools, keeping a nice clean house, waving politely to the neighbours. It's not questionable. My friends, we need to learn to discover what it looks like to live so counterculturally people will want to know, who the heck are you? Do you remember in, in Titus chapter 2, Paul writes to Titus saying, here's what I want to tell Here's what I want you to tell your churches to do. And then he's got this big, long directive. Do you remember, you know, your Bible's well enough to remember this? Old women, don't slander, don't drink too much wine. Uh, young men, be self-controlled. Slaves, don't steal from your masters. Do you remember this big, long directive? Old men, young men, old women, young women, slaves. He's got this big, long list of ethics and an alternate lifestyle they should lead. Now, when you first read it, you think to yourself, but Paul, like you're the guy who was set free from, from law, free from Jewish law, why are you instituting now another law, like a, like a Christian set of laws, until you get to verse 10, where Paul says, if you live this way, you will make attractive the gospel of God our Saviour. Or in some versions, it's you will adorn the gospel preaching. Why will we live this way, Paul? You old women will not slander your husbands and drink too much wine because every old woman does that. You young men will be self-controlled. Why? Because no Roman man lives like that. You slaves, you won't steal from your masters or humiliate them any chance you have because every slave does that. It's bizarre. It's questionable. It's intriguing. My friends, this I believe, is the primary missional imperative placed upon all believers. Evangelists have their peculiar role, but for the rest of us, if no one's asking you any questions, you're doing it wrong. And I don't just mean you're a pastor and so you work in Starbucks for the free Wi-Fi and coffee. It's not intriguing, guys, sorry. I'm saying you need to turn your neighbourhood upside down by loving the earth, by loving your neighbours, by loving the outcast, by speaking on behalf of the voiceless, not because we're social workers, not because we have some left-wing political agenda, but because these are the values of the reign of God and when God's people live like this, the most natural thing for the unbeliever to do is to say, why? And that is the opportunity Paul desires for you more than anything. When someone asks you why. Years ago when uh, Alan Hirsch and I were writing a book called The Shaping of Things to Come, we were in San Francisco trying to sniff out some missional projects and um, a number of people told us that we should go to the subterranean shoe room which is a shoe store in the Mission District of San Francisco. Now, we were looking for missional projects, not shoe stores, but people were so insistent that we check it out that we went along there and we discovered the subterranean shoe room was a shoe store run by a former Southern Baptist uh, church planter who'd moved to the Mission District. He loved shoes, obsessed apparently with shoes. And so he thought on the side, you know, this would be his kind of business entry into the neighborhood. So he opened this very funky little um, uh, shoe store called the Subterranean Shoe Room. 
Alan Hirsch and I, we walk in there. It's just a room with, with shelves everywhere, shoes everywhere, and a long chaise lounge down the middle of the room. We walk in, he asks, can he help us? We said, we're not actually here for any shoes. Uh, he looked at our feet and said, you could do with some shoes, but... <laughs> we said, we're here because someone told us this is some kind of missional thing that you've got going on here. Oh, he said, I don't know about that. I'm just a shoe store guy, he said, but I do do a little something a little different from most shoe store owners. We said, well, what do you do? He said, well, when people come into my shoe store, they're looking at shoes, and I, like any shoe store attendant, go over and I say, can I help you? And you say what everyone always says to a shoe store attendant, um, I'm okay, I'm just, just looking. And he said, at that point, I will say to them, well, if you have the time and you'd like to join me on the lounge, if you'd like to share with me your life story, I'll tell you what kind of shoes you're looking for. He says, customers kind of go, all right. <laughs> he said, some people can tell me their life story in like five minutes, some like 25 minutes. I was born here, I was raised there, I went to school here, my dad did this, my mum did that, I'm divorced, I'm straight, I'm gay, I'm Christian, I'm a doctor, I'm a lawyer, Blah, out comes their whole life story. Sometimes it comes out with tears and people sharing stuff they've never shared before. So they just tell them, they just unburden themselves of their whole life story. And then, because I know shoes, he said, I mean, I love shoes. So when you've told me your whole life story, I do know what kind of shoes a person like you would wear. So after you've shared with me your life story, I then say to you, wait right here. I select a pair of shoes and I say, is this what you're looking for? And you see, after they've opened their lives to me, they're like a little raw, so they usually look at the shoes and say, that's exactly what I'm looking for. <laughs> so he said, I, I like, I sell a lot of shoes. But he says, on the way out, while we're like, uh, we're, we're completing the transaction, they say to me, who are you? He says, I'm a shoe store guy. No, 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 like, like seriously, really, who are you? No, I'm a shoe store guy. No, you're like, you're like some kind of like Buddhist guru kind of sort of masquerading as a shoe store. No, I'm a, you're like a psychiatrist who decided to, no, I'm just a, you're like, like, like seriously, who are you? He said, at that point we get talking and he said, since I became a shoe store guy who listens, I've been invited to more parties, weddings, bar mitzvahs, divorce celebrations. <laughs> he says, I've spoken to people about Jesus a hundred times more since I became a surprising shoe store guy than when I ever was a Southern Baptist church planter. Even if you've got tattoos, even if you look kind of cool, no one's surprised when you tell them that you're a church planter. No one gives a... No one cares. <laughs> Seriously, if that's as surprising as you get, no one's going to ask, but I'll tell you what, in a city where apparently no one gets listened to, if you sit on a chase lounge and listen to them, that's intriguing. A few years ago, I was in uh, Portland, Oregon. I met a Southern Baptist uh, pastor. We were talking about being missional. We are talking about this very sort of subject I'm talking about now. And uh, uh, he said to me that he lives next door to a guy who claims to make the best margaritas in all of Oregon and uh, four or five times a year, he throws open the garage door and he makes margaritas for the whole neighborhood and all the guys come over and they play poker. The Southern Baptist lives right next door to him. He said, he used to invite me. He used to say, hey, come on over tonight, we're going to do this. After I said no about 20 times, he doesn't ask me anymore. He just says, oh, I should let you know we're doing the margaritas and poker tonight. I'll, I'll try and keep the noise down. He said to me, are you telling me I should say yes? I said, brother, what would be more questionable than a Southern Baptist minister at a margarita <laughs> poker night? 
He emailed me later. He said, I, uh, my neighbor told me, not invited me, just said, oh, I'll just let you know we're having another one of these nights. I said, would you mind if I join you? He said, my neighbor nearly fell over. <laughs> now, you know, Southern Baptists, like they sign a pledge or something that they'll never drink alcohol, right? And I respect that. I absolutely respect that. Salvation Army do the same thing. Totally respect that. I don't know what they're going to do in the age to come, but in this era, <laughs> they can't drink alcohol. I do genuinely respect that kind of pledge. And so, he says to his neighbor, um, I've signed this pledge, I'm a Southern Baptist, I can't drink. And the neighbor's like, so? He goes over to the neighbor's garage. He drinks soda all night. He's never played poker in his life. So every guy in the whole neighborhood <laughs> was thrilled with the possibility of corrupting <laughs> a Southern Baptist minister. He said, I talked to people about Jesus all night. Men who've been in that garage four or five times a year. My friends, how questionable is your life? How bizarre is it? Do you evoke anyone's curiosity? Because my friends, I actually believe it's a sacramental Christian vocation to intrigue others. Without it, no one asks, and when no one asks, all you've got left are those fake surveys, drawings on a napkin, blah, 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 blah. If you're an evangelist, my prayer for you is this. Be bold. Put your foot in the door, prize open every opportunity, and proclaim with clarity. But if that's not your gifting, if you're like most of us, this is your mission should you accept it. Live a questionable life.